Hey folks, how you guys doing? Hope you're all having a great day today. This is episode five, not The Empire Strikes Back, but instead electrical security and lighting. So this box right here is my, there you go, home security done right. This is a professionally monitored security system for the shop, something that I've been wanting for a while. I'll let you pause on that so you can read it if you want. Anyway, in this box is my entire home security system that I'm going to be using here for the shop. And more on that in just a little bit, I've got to unbox this and take inventory of it. But before I do that, let me go ahead and rewind to the beginning of last week before all of this uh, work with new lights was done. When I saw the shop in person for the first time, I noticed that it had a decent amount of lights installed, but they weren't energy efficient LEDs, they weren't spaced properly for even light distribution, and there wasn't enough light output in general. So from the very beginning, I planned on removing these lights and switching to LEDs. Luckily, my friend John wanted to reuse these lights around his homestead, so I told him that if, if he helped me remove them, then he could have them. Kind of a win-win a situation. Just removing these lights was all that it took to know that this scaffold was such a good purchase. I used it a tremendous amount this week. The lights were removed on a Friday evening before we lost daylight, and John ended up getting 10 8-foot fixtures that were hanging up, as well as one that was still in the box that the previous owners left. The next morning, which was a Saturday, was time to tackle the ceiling tin. This time, my friend Jeremy had a use for it, so I told him the exact same thing. Come help me remove it, and you can take as much of it as you want, which is, again, another really cool win-win situation. Removing the ceiling tin is the one thing that solved a lot of issues, though. Uh, I was having some issues with climate control in this space, and as I mentioned previously, I went back and forth so many times in regards to putting my office in the loft versus keeping it on the ground level, and in the end, removing the ceiling and getting spray foam insulation in the roof, it allows me to have one well-insulated open volume of air to work in, which in turn allows me to put my office in the loft as planned and free up more workspace on the floor. The unexpected result of removing the ceiling is also how much it, it visually opens up the space. The shop is a decent size to begin with, but it actually feels so much larger with the ceiling down. Later that day, my friend Brandon from Maddox Woodworks came out to help with the electrical and lighting. Brandon went to school for electrical work, and as I found out during this weekend, he is, he is much more efficient with it than I am. After we all got together to get a game plan on, on basically what I wanted to accomplish, Jeremy and I started cleaning up all of the rusty trash that covered absolutely every horizontal surface when we pulled the tin down. And then Brandon started making sense of the spider web of wires that were left behind by the previous owner. Brandon made quick work of determining what each wire was being used for and started kind of separating the spider web of wires while Jeremy and I mounted the portable sub panel that I used in my last shop to the corner of the loft. Now in my last shop, it was much easier to wire up a portable sub panel near the cluster of tools and then use it to feed each tool rather than run a bunch of new circuits in the main panel to each tool. Because I already had the materials to do so, I went with the same strategy here. After that, Jeremy and I focused on adding 2x4s perpendicular to the trusses to provide material to mount the lights to. Now these had to be a certain distance off the wall and I'll get into how the spacing was determined in just a bit. Before I get into mounting the lights, I want to reference a video I published in the old shop. This was from early 2018 when I switched from fluorescent lights to LED lights from American Green Lights. And when I made the switch, I wired up the new LED lights to a different circuit as the fluorescent lights so I could make a true side-by-side -side comparison. Now in these two examples, I have the camera exposure locked and I'm only changing the color balance to match what each light source is rated at. 65,000 K or Kelvin for the fluorescent lights and 5000 K for the LED lights. Now the LED lights use a lot less electricity, but they produce more light. My favorite thing about the LED light upgrade is the, it's the true, true to life colors that you actually see. This, this is called CRI or color rendering index. The higher the CRI value, the more accurate the colors you will see. In my opinion, true color output 
is just as important as having enough light output. Here's another comparison shot I made for American green lights when I could easily switch between both light sources. Now again, same camera exposure with just the color balance changed to match what each light source was rated at. Notice how, I guess, gloomy and muddy the colors look when they were lit by the fluorescent lights. And it wasn't always this bad. Fluorescents, they just get bad over time or they get worse over time. Uh, the fluorescent lights changed so much over the few years that I used them in that space that I was, I was constantly tweaking the custom color balance values in my camera, basically boosting the magenta output in my camera to offset the green hue, and it continuously changed every so often. So if you have RGB, you also have CMY. So CMYK and RGB are the two common color spaces that are, are used, but they're, they're opposites. So opposite of red is cyan. So R and RGB is red, C and CMYK is cyan. Opposite of green is magenta. Opposite of blue is yellow. So if you need to increase or decrease one, then you increase or decrease the other. Then in this case, too much green means boost the magenta. Now I'm bringing up all of that old footage because in this shop, I didn't have a way or desire to hook up both light sources at the same time. So with that information in mind, I sent my completed SketchUp shop layout file to Jim at American Green Lights as soon as it was finalized. And I'm, I'm doing the air quotes and finalized there. Uh, American Green Lights also offers a lighting simulation service, which I'll, I'll briefly cover here. I'm not sure the exact process or what all goes into determining what lights are needed, but, but here's the gist of it. I provided the SketchUp model to Jim. He used that information to create a simulation model, which he used to create a lighting layout to determine how much light is needed in the ceiling. How much light is in the ceiling simulates the amount of light that is actually landing on the work surfaces. And the target is to have a minimum of 60 FC, which is, is foot candle, uh, around the, the general work areas like the computer desk and the, and the office cabinets and uh, anywhere from 80 to 100 or so foot candles in the, uh, the work surfaces like the workbenches and the machine tops. By the way, a, a foot candle is a unit of illuminance or light intensity. One foot candle represents the illuminance cast on a surface by one candle, one foot away. I didn't know that, but now I do. One thing to note is the higher values at the miter saw station. This is because you and the saw are, are generally leaning over the work and casting a shadow on the cut surface. The extra light from a couple different directions reduces the shadows and increases visibility at this location. A second thing to note is the computer desk and office cabinets near the top wall. Now, like I said, I went back and forth on leaving the office on ground level and putting it up in the loft. And poor Jim, I didn't make his job easy sending him an email every time I changed my mind. I really didn't. I uh, didn't mean to do all that, but the last information I sent him was with the office like it is in this diagram, still on floor level, but it's going to be okay. It, the office will go up in the loft, and when I put the office up there, I'll likely use this area on the wall for project staging or cart, uh, cart and rolling tool storage. There will be plenty of light along that wall, according to this diagram, uh, for for that, and I plan on using a couple of the 24 watt lights that I took down from the last shop to get the same great lighting in the office. Once the layout generated the appropriate foot candle values, an actual layout diagram could be generated to locate the lights. This is a great example of how proper planning on the front end can yield perfect even lighting results without much experimentation and wasted time in the shop. The layout will have three rows of 96 watt fixtures and a few 24 watt fixtures here and there to fill in as needed. Here's a graph that shows the color output of a few light sources, T8 fluorescent lights on the bottom with the dominant green wavelength and a much weaker wavelength for all of the other colors. The 95 CRI LED lights in the middle producing light in every visible wavelength. And of course, noonday sunlight on top being high in all visible wavelengths. 
The next day, Brandon and I started working on the lights, and one upgrade I noticed with these lights versus the LEDs I put in my last shop is the addition of a quick connect fitting on the electrical wiring. Standard hot, neutral, and ground connections are required on a 120 volt circuit, but the addition of this quick connect allows the drivers to be easily replaced in the future without having to disconnect any wire nuts or push in wire connectors or anything like that. So it's really nice to see subtle improvements like this being made over time with products. Here's a quick tip before we get on the scaffold to install the lights. Add a magnet or two to your scaffold when doing electrical work. <laughs> they always hold onto tiny screws much better than I do. With the layout diagram in hand, we pulled our way around the shop installing the lights. Starting with the dust collector corner, we went up and down each row just screwing the fixtures into place. Then we went back and added wiring between each fixture. Now for this step, I, I felt a little cluttered on the scaffold and I felt like I was slowing Brandon down. So I jumped down and started being productive with other tasks on the ladder. And it wasn't until the, the last few lights that I used the ladder to start pulling wire ahead of Brandon. And we probably could have saved, I don't know, half hour to an hour had I started pulling wire from the very beginning. You always find the little things that really speed up the process right before you're done. As we went along, the light hoods were also installed. And after that, I, I really didn't get any more footage of the lights being installed as it's just a lot of repetition. I also didn't get any footage of the rest of our electrical work because the camera angles from down below were basically all the same. We added a few more outlets to the loft, one outlet to the outside porch ceiling area, one 240 volt and one 120 volt outlet to the small section of wall between the roll-up doors and a dedicated 240 volt circuit to the back corner of the shop for the dust collector. But do you remember the spider web of wires that we had near the electrical panel to start with? This is what we ended up with. I was able to get them at least zip tied and, and stapled in such a way that it doesn't make my head hurt as much. Here's a few before and after pictures of the ceiling and old lights versus no ceiling and new lights. Now keep in mind that all of these were shot on my cell phone with full auto settings and HDR turned on, which the HDR, it does a great job at evening up the low lit spots. In person, the LED light is much more even and the colors look a lot more, I guess lively is the best way to put it. They look a lot more accurate. Next up is the Simply Safe security system, which is the sponsor of this video. And I knew before moving into this shop that I wanted to get a security system so that I could more easily keep an eye on things when I can't physically be in the shop. This setup I'm installing is professionally monitored 24 seven and also allows me to see into the shop on my phone, no matter where I'm at. The system is incredibly easy to install and use and the monitoring service has competitive pricing at about 50 cents per day, and there's no contracts. Like I said, Simply Safe is sponsoring this video, and I wasn't asked to go into great detail with my setup, but I've never had a security system before, and I do think this whole system is interesting, and some of you out there can benefit from this. So, I wanted to show you an example of how this can completely cover your shop or your home. The following clip, it's a little long-winded, a little long-winded explanation of how I initially set this up. And of course, I tweaked it after the video so the whole world doesn't really know my exact setup. And of course, go to simplysafe.com slash jbates to learn more. All right, I've got two cameras going. I've got one over there uh, showing the base station. And then this one right here has got it, basically the back of the camera is up against a little section of wall in between the two roll up doors. So hopefully you can see as much of the shop as possible. Right behind the camera is a motion detector. So mounted to the wall is a motion detector that can sweep 90 degrees to the left and 90 degrees to the right. And it will cover this whole section of the shop as far as motion detecting. But there's a little bit of redundancy because both cameras in this setup have motion detecting as well. So let me just walk you through the whole system. I, I do have that other camera on there because every time that the system is armed or disarmed, Alarm off. On the main entry door that you can't see here on the camera, there is an entry sensor. Uh, and the window, which you can start to see over here on the camera, there is another entry sensor. When both of those, either one of those is tripped, it makes a little jingle. So I just open the door 
and open the window. It sets that off over there, makes a little jingle. You can adjust the volume to all that. In between both of these windows, the uh, window for the main entry door, as well as this sliding window right here on top of the cabinet. Can you see it? Oh, pooey, you can't see it. But there is a glass break sensor. So if someone shatters glass, it will trip that sensor because if someone wants to get through the window without setting off the entry sensor, just break the window, right? Well, it'll set that off. I've got one over here and then one by the miter saw station in between both of those windows. Right up here is the first camera, and this one points towards all four of these main entries. So both garage roll-up doors, the main entry door, and this window that can all be seen from this camera. It has a 30-foot motion-activated range, so it can reach the furthest corner no problem at all. It can't see or reach anything behind it. So for that, I've got a second camera up in this back corner and the motion range of it covers this entire back half of the shop, no problems. But what's cool about that location is the visual range of it. That camera can see the entire shop with no problems at all. Up way at the peak on the front side of the loft, that's where the smoked alarm number one is at, or the first one. And near the back wall on, on top of the stairs, that's where the second smoke alarm is at. So those are hooked up to the system as well. Right at the front ledge of the loft is the 105 decibel siren. Hmm, that was loud. Um, the, the base station went off as well as the siren there. Am I forgetting anything? I don't think I am. Um, yeah, it's, it's, this is a system that can be uh, seen anywhere from my cell phone uh, because it is hooked up to my Wi-Fi system. But if you, uh, you know, the Wi-Fi goes down and you think that may hinder the system, it does have cellular data backup as well as battery backup. So this is pretty cool. And uh, oh, the base station, or not the base station, the keypad. This is one thing I wanted to show you. You guys saw me mount this next to uh, the main entry door. If I have someone to come um, check on things while I'm gone, you can set up, let me enter my password so you can't see it. So now in here, you can go to, there you go, you can see it. If I go, if I press the top of the screen up to pins, press enter or forward, you can see that I've already set up a user one. This is a, just a bogus one that I set up just for this demonstration. So I can add it or remove it or change it. But that means that if I, um, if I leave somewhere, then this person can use password 9876, which again is bogus, just to get in here to change it as well. Simply safe on home. So, all right, so now it's armed as home. So this home setting is if I am home, say I'm sleeping, I still want to have the security system activated, but I don't want it to trip for all the motion sensors, say me moving around in my house. This is just going to uh, be activated for entry sensors. So let me open the door really quick. If I come over here, open the door, you hear it beeping. So now, Alarm enter a password off. to deactivate it. So home is if you're home and you still want it. And of course, away is, well, that's away. Anyway, I think I'm rambling here. I'm a little excited to have this set up. Alarm I've got off. a decent size investment here, as you guys know. This is my business, this is my livelihood, and a security system is something that's been in the back of my head for a long time, ever since I knew we were going to a standalone workshop. Um, location that had a standalone workshop. It's not attached to the house, so I'm not out here all the time and being able to see what's going on out here as well as um, monitor it for security is something that I've really been wanting for a while. So thank you to Simply Safe for sponsoring this video and giving me a little bit more peace of mind. Uh, on to the next thing, which is tidying up in here. After that, it was back to organizing the shop little by little. First up was to get the miter saw station cleaned off and start putting items where they belong. Now you'll notice that the lower left cabinet is the only thing that was shifted when I assembled the station in this shop. 
I don't have a wall to the left like I did in the last shop, so I just moved that lower cabinet to the end. No additional bracing was added below as I don't think it's necessary. The reason being is that each of the upper cabinets is screwed together and the top cubbies are screwed to each other as well as to the cabinets down below and all that is secured to the work surface. Because they are all tied together, in order for the cabinets to sag over the large span on bottom, everything on top would have to compress in from the sides. I've been able to walk on top of the work surface and haven't noticed any sagging. Another item to check off the to-do list was to assemble my new Rockler router table. Since getting my CNC machine, I change out router bits way more frequently than I ever have. I still have my lever router lift in the table saw wing, but I wanted to keep that one dedicated to a flush trim bit and use this router table for project specific tasks. This cabinet has an integrated dust collection and a cast iron top and the lift is Rockler's Pro Lift. I bought the same large Porter cable router that I have in my homemade router lift to go in it. Next, the fence is installed and it's moved into position right next to the CNC machine to complete this little tool island. The workbench area will be along this back wall and as I mentioned in part two of the shop series, I'm not sure if I'm going back to having a tool wall or not. It, it looks great on camera and it's handy for first order of retrieval items, but I'm kind of, you know, leaning more towards a cabinet or a rolling tool chest of some kind to better protect the tools. If the weather is nice outside, I like to open the doors and get fresh air into the shop, and that means the humidity creeps in too, and where there is high humidity, there is a greater chance of condensation and rust. Anyway, I ended up getting both workbenches clear, the clamp rack mounted and loaded in close proximity to the workbenches and future assembly table area, and my square and straight edge board mounted to the wall as well. You can see that the back workbench, it's kind of dark, a little bit dark, and that's because I have yet to, I guess, wiggle the workbench into its final location, and that will determine the final location of the light that will be installed above it. I mentioned installing a couple more outlets to the loft. Two of them are on each of the front corners of the loft and they are dedicated to cord reels. A cord reel is it's one of those things that once I installed one in my last shop for the first time, I'll never not have one in any shop space that I'm working in. They are incredibly handy and are way, way more convenient than using a traditional extension cord in the wall. I put one above the right side of where the future assembly table will be, one on the opposite side of the loft for any, I guess, non-stationary power tool needs on that side of the shop, and then one between the roll-up doors to be used on the driveway in front of the shop. This setup completely future-proofs all remote power needs in the shop. All right, this is basically the end of the video. I have no idea what I'm going to say in the rest of the video's narration, so I may be a little bit redundant here, and if I am, I apologize. So, just to recap, we took down all of the ceiling tin, which opened the space up quite a bit, and I, that was such a good decision, in my opinion. Getting that taken down uh, just makes this whole space feel so much larger, uh, which it is a large space. Uh, this, the roof will be spray foamed, next week, uh, maybe by the time this video is published, I'm not sure. Dog barking, which is fine. So uh, after that, we ran a couple new uh, electrical outlets here and there, and we also installed the LED lights from American Green Lights. These are the exact same lights that I had in my last shop, uh, LED lights. And <laughs> as a matter of fact, because they were, um, the lighting was, what's the word I'm looking for? There was a lighting simulation, that's what it was, to get a certain amount of output on each one of the surfaces. Um, because we went with that particular strategy from the last shop and this shop, I'm actually using the exact same camera exposure in this shop that I was using in my last shop. So I'm already familiar with the lights, which is fantastic. Uh, these lights are bright, they're high CR, they have a high CRI value, which is color rendering index, so the colors are actually true to the eye. They're true colors, they're not muddy like fluorescence. That's a huge plus for both video work as well as properly seeing what you're doing. Now I didn't 
install all of the lights because I'm not 100% sure on the exact placement of my workbenches back there. I'm not 100% decided on what I'm going to do with the stairs in the back. If I'm going to leave them, change them, I don't know. Still flip flopping on that. And there are a couple lights that need to be installed under there in that location. So um, when I make a final decision on that, I will install those, those extra couple lights. Uh, but the main work area in here is, is just, it's lit. It's nice. Um, the electrical outlets we installed, there's two on the front side of this loft and each one has a cord reel on each end. This cord reel over here will no problem be anywhere around my assembly table, which is going to be in this location. And I'm right handed, so it's going to be on the right side of me, which is where I want all of the electrical and wiring and all that stuff for the, uh, this, this assembly table. So that's nice. The one on that side is going to basically future proof any type of situational tasks that I might have on that wall for you know whatever hand tools I'm using. It's not going to be used for any type of uh, standalone power to a machine. So that kind of future proofs a lot of stuff on that wall. And I have a quarter reel in between both big doors that's 40 feet long so I can roll up a door and then go outside if needed off of that quarter reel. So I'll have a lot of electricity options just by adding a couple quarter reels. And I have one more that I have not installed today because it's dark and I don't want to run an impact driver outside uh, just to, as respect for my neighbors. So by the time this video gets published, I'll have a, at least an image to show you of one cord reel that's going to be installed right outside the door on that little porch area that I have right outside the door. So electrical was a huge plus. Uh, security, the security system, Simply Safe Security, uh, I've already mentioned everything that I have here in the shop. And just for further security reasons, obviously I'm gonna change things up just a little bit as far as the camera locations and such. Um, so there's that. Thank you Simply Safe for sponsoring this video. Um, and what else did I do today? I moved, in, moved a bunch of stuff and cleaned up and it's starting to come together as a shop, which I just, I just wanna get back to work. I'm, I just wanna get back to, to making stuff. I know a lot of people get a lot of enjoyment out of building a shop space or seeing a shop space being built. And I do a little bit, but I really, really wanna get back to making furniture and making cool stuff. The reason for ending this video now is tomorrow I'm starting in on the dust collection system. So that'll be in the next video. That's it for sure. You guys take care, have a great day, and I'll talk to you in the next video.